So joining me on today's episode of the podcast is someone from America, so it'll be a different accent from the usual guests, and it is Nava Hopkins from Wordstream. Thank you, Nava, for joining me. Uh, th- thank you for, for having me, and you, you got it exactly right. Um, the, the way I, I get everyone to say my name correctly uh, is I'm, I'm an avid coffee drinker, so it's Java, but with an N at the beginning and an H at the end. <laughs> you, you got it spot on. Yeah, <laughs> I, I would have probably... Had uh, hadn't met you before in in Portugal and stuff, probably said something completely different. <laughs> um, you've got one of those names. It's like Neve, where it's it it's not like for me. There's certain names like uh, Siobhan, even you know. Yeah. I, I, and you, can you look at it and you go, is that Saihoban or you know how the hell do I say this? Um, or Neve looks like Nima. And and Nava, and you just automatically think that that can't possibly just be Nava. It's going to have to be some. It's got to be Nava or something like, else. Yeah, either <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, or Nava, or you know, some crazy way of saying it. So, um, so on the subject of names, um, and I don't know if, if you find this, um, I intentionally when I got married took uh, my husband's name uh, Hopkins instead of Fuchs because I was tired of having two very difficult. Um, names for people to pronounce because when you're having a conversation with clients, when you're having a conversation with, with industry professionals, um, then if you make someone feel awkward because they, they don't know what to say, um, my first name's already kind of awkward enough, but with the fugue spelled F U C H S, um, that's, that's yeah. equally awkward. Uh, so it, it was kind of a, a, a no brainer to transition the brand into Hopkins so that I'd, I'd only have one difficult piece. Yeah, I actually noticed that your Twitter handle. Is still yeah. Nava Fuchs, um, which I would have normally said fucks or Fuques or some shit like that. <laughs> exactly, uh, so exactly. I, <laughs> I'm glad you have actually um, changed it and, and do go by the, the Hopkins. I think it suits you a it, lot better. Well, what's funny is um, I put all of the, the stress stuff. So like my certifications, my taxes, my mortgage, all of that goes under Fuchs. But my happiness goes under Hopkins. And so it's... I can compartmentalize my life in, in a really productive way. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, name, names are a strange one. I've had a few guests on here and had their names all over the place, but it's fun trying to learn them. Mm. Um, but I'm getting better at it. I now just see what it looks like and they can't really blame you for that. So no. yeah, it's all good. But on the subject of your name and getting it out and all that kind of stuff, I jokingly said to you when we bumped into each other in uh, Vegas, uh, Popcorn Vegas, yeah, um, that you were appearing everywhere, <laughs> and you literally are um, doing really well for yourself. Um, and as I say, I, I met you in Portugal and uh, with the same rush thing, but uh, earlier on this year or the middle of this year or whenever it was, um, and ever since then. Um, you know, everywhere I look, every conference, I just keep seeing your face popping up. And obviously, we've done a webinar, I think, before and and stuff like that. But everywhere I look now, I just keep seeing, oh, Nava's speaking again. And um, so, how is that all going? Is that a new thing, or am I just now because we've met each other, I'm just seeing you everywhere? Like, how how is that working? So, what's interesting is I, I've been in the industry since 2008 but I focused a lot of effort on getting the tactical skills uh, for my first couple of years. So around 2016 or so, I I made a big push um, to go on the larger speaking circuit. Uh, But up until that point, I actually was doing a lot of local conferences, um, local webinars. um, And prior to uh, joining WordStream, uh, where, where I currently work, I actually had started um, a nonprofit around and connecting students to uh, scholarships and mentors, it unfortunately uh, is, is no longer running. Um, but what that did for me, that experience did for me, is build a network that I then could connect um, and get opportunities for myself in micro moments and micro moments build onto larger moments. Um, and so over the, the past couple of years, I've, I've been willing to take maybe smaller engagements or non-paid engagements um, to build the brand. Um, and now I'm in I'm I'm very blessed that I'm I'm in a spot where I actually can 
share insights learned, but then also collect insights. Um, and again, very blessed uh, working with WordStream, uh, where I get to not only work with our customers, I also get to share those lessons learned externally. So it's it's kind of the best of both worlds. I get to empower a brand I care a lot about, um, and then I also get to empower myself. It's interesting um, that, you know, I always tell people that as well, when people, because people always have jokes at you saying, yeah, do you ever do any work? You're always on stage and all that kind of stuff. But what you actually learn when you are speaking is invaluable you know just speaking to other people and stuff I think it's a uh, great to hear that you also feel that you know it is part of a overall learning curve for yourself as well so um, I feel very much the same way um, like giving back but also I'm picking up a lot along the way as well. And- we, we, we have to be selfish like it's yeah. it's not reasonable to take an engagement if you're not going to earn or learn or grow. Um, and so one of the, the nice things, um, and I've, I've been seeing you pop up quite a bit as well internationally, and it's like every time I see you, uh, where you're speaking, I'm like, ah, I want to get into that conference. Um, it, it's, it, it seems like there's conferences that are really good for learning, and there are conferences that are really good for influence. Um, and to, to your initial question of like, how do we get out there? Um, We unfortunately, I think, have to pay our dues and do some influence conferences where we maybe aren't going to necessarily learn as much, but the publicity is going to be fantastic. Um, And then you do the smaller conferences where you're not going to necessarily be seen as much, but the insights that you get are out of this world because it's all technicians. Um, And it's just people that are living, breathing in accounts that then are sharing what they learn. Yeah. It's a... Yeah, I think there's a process to it. You can never just walk into these positions. Um, But one question I was going to ask, does working with a brand like Wordstream open doors easier for you or is it still quite difficult because it is you as a person that's speaking? So it it depends. Um, I find that Wordstream and working with Wordstream – we re- the WordStream brand, when you think of it, is a data brand. So people take my data sets far more seriously um, because of the width and breadth uh, of the data sets that I have to work with because of the credibility of the company. Um, but there, there is also a degree that WordStream as a brand represents beginner content. Um, and so I actually sometimes find that um, and this this is not a, a knock against WordStream. It's like WordStream intentionally goes after SMBs and looks to empower them and the agencies that serve them. Um, but WordStream is seen as a beginner. And so I, I find that I sometimes have to prove that and, and maybe overcompensate that I'm actually a clever practitioner and I actually know what I'm doing as opposed to kind of a beginner practitioner. Um, so it's, yes, it is 100% empowered me and opened doors for me. Um, but it also very much has ma- made me almost overcompensate for the the level of content that I bring, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. No, perfect sense, perfect sense. I think, uh, you know, when you're doing these kind of things, it's it's all right, all good and well, WordStream opening up doors for you, but you've then got to deliver if you want to be seen again. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's there's... You know, any person could probably get a door open for them to go on that stage. But, you know, if they're going to be up there being a quivering wreck and deliver... Um, Mediocre you know, content. <laughs> then you, you are going to be in, you know, serious trouble. And it's obviously a pointless exercise if you've got, you know, a lack of ability on stage. It's not as easy as it looks. Um, I know that when people look at the photographs and stuff, they go, okay, anyone could do that. But it's a lot of stuff that goes into it, including making slides and... Um, and well, it's obviously in- still nerve-wracking as well. It, it can be, but what's interesting is I've actually put a lot of effort over the past two years in growing the pool of thought leaders within WordStream. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that there are some people that I get to try it and they realize they hate it. There are other people that they get the bug and they just go after it with abandon. Um, and so... One of the things that I think really is the quote unquote tell of whether someone is going to be a presenter versus um, a behind the scenes data set creator or practitioner um, is whether they actually enjoy getting the quote unquote credit for the work that they do um, or whether they prefer to just 
keep their heads down and keep learning and they, they don't actually care about the credit. Um, I will put my hand up and say I am, well, so I, I, I jokingly refer to myself as a border collie. Like I love tasks. I love getting things done. Like I'm a super high energy person. I don't know if you noticed. Um, but I also like pats on the head. Like I like engineering pats on the head for myself. Um, and what I find is that those that are going to go chase thought leadership opportunities, at least um, internally within WordStream, enjoy the pats on the head. Um, and they, they are willing to put in the extra work. They're willing to craft those presentations. They're willing to, to like really invest um, not just the, um, intel- the intelligence in terms of work, but also the emotional intelligence in, ter- in terms of charisma and, and whatnot. Um, they, they have to have that mentality um, because otherwise it's, it's exhausting. Like it genuinely is exhausting to be on for a full conference. Um, I, I know uh, you mentioned at the beginning, we were, uh, we, we kind of hung out at PubCon Vegas. That entire week I was exhausted because I was always on. Um, I did the master's um, and that was, that was a draining experience. I would do it a hundred times over again, but it's, it's exhausting. And so to find people that have not just the intelligence to, to create good data sets, but also the drive to go and present them uh, is tough. Um, it's not even that as well. Like on top of you know what you're doing in terms of presentations and and stuff, what I find quite exhausting is when you come off a stage and then you've got loads of people that want to talk to you. Um, and See, you that's my favorite to, part. Like, it's fun, but do you not find it like some people um, like they they just over try they, they try and suck up too much of your time and it's like a drain i find that part really like i like talking to people and talking sense to people but there's certain people that come up to you and they can't just accept like a quick answer they want to dive deeper into things and yet you're trying to get away and you're like oh, you know i find that part quite draining um but that's just me personally i don't know i i'm very giving of my time because I like helping people, um, that that part doesn't bother me. The part that bothers me is when someone goes on an ego trip and asks a, a, a quote unquote question that's really meant to inflate their own persona, um, or challenges you just for attention, but doesn't actually want to have the conversation later. Um, I was I was at a conference uh, in Australia, and these two gents in the back uh, started heckling me in the middle of my presentation, just saying that they didn't believe that it could work. It didn't. They didn't think it, it could work. Um, and so I went up to them afterwards um, in in private to actually have the conversation and dive into the data. Um, they didn't want to have the conversation with me. They just walked away. So I'm. A hundred percent happy to have a conversation with someone um, if it's if they truly want to have a conversation. What I have zero tolerance for is ego hounds and just being destructive for the sake of uh, a, a kind of an ego boost or a, uh, a relevance boost. Yeah, ego hounds is the best way to to put it. That's a good name for them. Um, had a, again had a few of that myself and. People, when you stand on stage, there's always someone wanting to stick one on you and, and and you know make you look stupid or whatever it, you know whatever it may be or make themselves look good. Um, but that I, yeah, had that a few times myself. It can be frustrating, but I suppose it's a bit of a compliment if as well. You know, people are trying to take you down. You must be doing something right. So, but this game's a matter of opinions and mm. no one has all the answers anyway. And you are certainly entitled to your opinion, given that you work with large sets of data and probably have more insights than most, um, you know, when well, so it comes to data and stuff. Uh, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm, I consider myself very blessed in is that I not only get access to data sets, I get access to hundreds, thousands of individual businesses and, and agencies and how they function, how they think, and when a strategy will work and when it won't. So the, the kind of kiss of death in PPC is when you assume that the strategy that worked five, 10 years ago is going to work indefinitely. Um, and so where a lot of folks I feel have been very stressed in PPC right now um, is that their tactics that they kind of held to, clung to, are now not relevant anymore um, with the increase in automation, with um, the increase in 
uh, more of a focus on strategy and creative and less a focus on kind of granular manual work. Um, and so as they're kind of fighting for relevancy, they, they have to learn again. And if you turn off that learning mindset um, too soon in your career, which is silly, you should like we in, the, in any digital marketing platform, you should always be learning. But if you turn it off early, it's really hard to get back into it. So I think the people that, that are the quote unquote haters are the ones that just don't know how to adapt and they're going to become irrelevant. And so yeah. we'll, we'll just have a whole bunch of really happy learning, ever growing practitioners and, and everyone else will fade in, fade off into the, into the distance. That's, that's the, the best way to look at it. So in talking about pay-per-click there, so pay-per-click is your thing. Um, mm. And obviously reading up on your profile and having uh, spoke with you before in previous webinars, I know that you, um, if I get this correct, I can't remember if I'm 100% accurate, but you were an SEO who then went into pay-per-click, is that right? Yeah, so I actually got my start in directory SEO which is the worst kind of SEO ever, which is probably why I got out of SEO because I thought that all SEO was 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 that bad. Um, so what happened is I, I worked right around the time of Panda and Penguin, um, the very first iterations of them, uh, connecting sites to this like directory scheme. And I didn't realize how bad it was until I, I spent a little bit more time uh, in, in that company. Um, and when I realized the ethics and, and the, the damage that my working on that was doing, I was like, I am, I am done. I'm, I'm going to go. Uh, so I took the money I made working there, started the nonprofit, as well as a side agency uh, where I freelanced and did uh, pay-per-click because I, I had got my certifications uh, while I was still in school uh, and, and just kind of did some freelance work. But then... I kind of hit this burnout point because between my nonprofit not doing well um, because I was running out of money and kind of doing it all by myself, not fully by myself. Uh, my husband, and I actually tag teamed it. Uh, he was my uh, lovely at the time. Now, now my husband. Um, and then I needed a job to recover um, from how mentally, emotionally exhausted I was by running this nonprofit and this freelance agency um, at the same time, which I do not recommend. It is unless you you have the the financial backing to to, to do it. Um, so I stumbled into WordStream after actually taking a year of working as a nanny of all things, because I needed like truly just to detox myself. Um, and in working at WordStream, what I was able to do was have a job that I knew I could do. It was super easy and recharge in myself. Um, the innovator, the entrepreneur. Uh, so my pay-per-click journey allowed me to touch on paid search, yes, but also paid social, um, a, a little bit of display work, more recently YouTube. But the where the SEO kind of empathy comes from is that I never gave up my curiosity in SEO. I just knew I didn't want to actively dedicate my life to it. Um, so yeah, uh, where I find a lot of paid folks struggle to get their heads wrapped around SEO um, because it, it seems like it's far more technical um, than they're used to. All the tools that are currently in paid are approaching the level of technical chops that you need on the SEO side. So a paid practitioner and an SEO practitioner should be working together. Um, they shouldn't be siloed. Um, particularly because, um, and this is actually, I'll give a shout out to Jory Ford. She's over at um, GG Crowd. Uh, she made this amazing point. This is just like one little nugget if you want an actionable nugget. Um, with quality score, how quality score is relevancy the, or the landing page relevancy is determined is actually by the Google um, ad crawl bot. Um, and SEOs will unintentionally, to help with load time, kill that bot. So the paid folks are seeing their quality scores drop. Um, and so like one little thing you can do is just make sure that the pages that paid folks are driving leads to allow that bot to be there. Um, and it's, it's a simple little thing, but can can really unlock that much more potential. Yeah. I realized that was like a winding tangent random 
<laughs> idea, <laughs> but I, I wanted to make sure that I got at least one actionable nugget in, into this and, and credit it appropriately. Yeah, no, it's uh, interesting. And obviously, you know, these are kind of any nuggets good for anyone listening, but it's uh, certainly one of those nuggets that you wouldn't think of just off the bat. You would obviously need to have that experience to, you know, think about that logically and um, stuff like that. But as you say, a, a lot of what goes on, and I don't know if it's still as frequent, but as you say, a lot of people, um, like SEO guys will hate pay-per-click guys and vice versa and that you know they fight against each other with clients to try and shove each other out the way um and stuff like that. I certainly know I've done it in the past where the pay-per-click guys try to get more budget from a client and uh, I've come in muscled in and just, you know, mocked um <laughs> pay-per-click if you like, so that I could get the budget, which obviously business is business, but the reality of it is they both work very well together, um, and that's something that we do want to talk about. And they're obviously very like for like as well in terms of keyword research and and you know everything else. And obviously, pay per click still take up well. Pay per click are taking up a hell of a lot more than, of the landscape than uh, organic search. So you have to have the balance right. Um, and obviously, Google are trying to, in my opinion, force pay per click on people anyway, as it's one of their biggest revenue streams. Well, so what's interesting with um, brands that struggle, uh, you could do a very easy test to say like what is truly organic traffic versus what is uh, paid traffic. Um, in analytics, you can take uh, a segment uh, like uh, organic traffic, um, port it over into Google Ads as an audience and just exclude that audience from your pay-per-click. So if you wanted to see like how much was organic inflating your pay-per-click revenues or how much was pay-per-click kind of stealing traffic, um, 100% you could do that. What's also interesting uh, with audiences, um, and this this is really where I, I feel organic um, and, and paid should be working together. Um, not every business, it makes sense uh, to focus on uh, Google search. Um, Google search is expensive. Um, you might want to do Facebook. You might want to do display. You might want to do Microsoft or Bing. Um, and what's interesting is that if you have your, your targets in place, your, your pixels in place, um, you can actually blitz the market so that your organic is prepared to pick up kind of the, the transactional search where maybe your display or your social pave the way. Um, so when we talk about pay-per-click, it's not just about search. Um, it, it really truly is thinking about the social engagements um, and how we create conversations. It's about um, educating folks. Um, so one, one of actually uh, the, the campaigns that I, I love to run, particularly when organic is strong, um, is an educational campaign uh, via YouTube where you actually target the market to grow like the available prospects that you, you could have. Um, and with YouTube, depending on the, on the ad type you choose, as long as the user skips before either the 15 or 30 second mark, you're not going to pay for that click. So it can be a very educational piece uh, to blitz the market, get the brand um, in people's heads, and then organic can, can come in and win. Um, the other one that I, I have to give the shout out to, it's it's one of my unequivocal favorites, particularly in thinking about audiences, um, is dynamic search ads, um, which specifically revolve around how well a site is it can be crawled. Um, and so you actually target, instead of keywords, you target sections of the site so that you can cover hundreds, thousands of landing pages without having to invest a substantial budget. Um, but what's nice about it is that you can actually layer on uh, in market signals. Uh, say, I'm in market for uh, hotels in Bologna because I'm, I'm going to be going to a, a conference there uh, in, in April. Um, and I'm going to take my husband with me and we're, we're going to go have a little Italian adventure. And I'm very excited about it. Um, so I have, because I've been researching it and going to sites and, and, and kind of going to, to uh, look at hotels, looking at like what day trips to do. I have been tagged as in market 
uh, for, for that sort of uh, endeavor. So layering on that on top of a, dy- a dynamic search ad campaign specifically focused around uh, hotels, specifically focused around uh, travel gear, whatever, um, is a really powerful way to pre-qualify traffic. So before you invest, you're actually getting um, the best bang for your buck without having the waste. Like someone else has pre has spent the money to pre-qualify them for you, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, I think um, when you do talk about all of this stuff, it does make sense when you see it. The problem for the majority of people, and including myself, because I'm not um, a paid ad specialist as such, um, but obviously you're working with, you're doing paid ads day in, day out. You have access to all of that data day in, day out, uh, and you're at a strong advantage. I mean, for others out there who are looking to learn um, about paid search, other than coming to conferences and listening to people like yourself who've got a lot to say in the matter, like, is there online courses that you feel are going to help people, or do you have an online course? or yep. you know, how? So yeah. I'm going to give a shout out. Uh, we, we just recently formed uh, the Paid Search Association. Uh, we actually do a really good job of aggregating courses, blogs, uh, resources that that we, we believe in, um, paidsearchassociation.org. Uh, um, you can also just do a search for us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, I also have to give a shout out to WordStream's uh blogs. Um, we put a ton of resources uh, and, and effort into making sure that not only are people excited about our product and, and working with us for the, as both the software and the agency, um, but that also people are informed to, to go do themselves. Uh, we, we care a lot that, that you know what you're doing. Um, I also strongly recommend, strongly, um, go through, because it costs you absolutely zero dollars to do it. The resources uh, for Google Ads um, Academy um, and for Microsoft uh, Ads Academy. Because what's what's useful about that is it's not that necessarily you should drink the Kool-Aid, party line, um, go do everything that, that they say, um, but they, they make an effort to show you via video, via article, um, what you need to do. And what's actually really nice is that it, once you get fully certified, um, and this is actually why I, I turned to certification when I was in school, um, they'll actually refer you and include you in a directory of practitioners if someone's looking for a, a paid uh, person. Um, in terms of where to do audiences, where to do DSA, um, it's actually really funny. Um, uh, Steve Hammer and I just did a masterclass uh, at a PubCon that kind of walked through the steps. Um, if, if it's interesting to you, I'm happy to send you uh, a couple of blog posts that talk specifically about audiences and, and dynamic search ads to, to go along with this podcast. Um, but yeah, like there's Search Engine Journal is great. Search Engine Land is great. Um, but the, the best thing that you can do is actually to set up an account that you never actually fund and just go play in the interface. Um, it costs you $0.00 to set up an ad account. Um, and people ask me all the time, how did you learn this? How, how did you, like, who taught you? Who, like, what? And there, there are absolutely people who mentored me. Um, but the, the core of how most of us that are, we'll say, competent got, got our chops is by cutting our teeth in the platform and just finding things and figuring it out. Um, and I, I highly recommend Anyone who's interested in, in paid, whether it's paid search, paid social, paid display, paid video, um, just sign up for the account and go play. It costs you zero dollars to do. Interesting. No, I was just curious. Um, as I say, you know, people like you who breathe it, it's the same as SEO for me. You know, you just find those little gaps where you can play, uh, you know, just little, not loopholes as such, but just little intricate details that make all the difference um now another question i've got for you is obviously pay-per-click stands for pay-per-click and is often just associated with adwords and um, for a lot of people and i know you work for word streaming you don't do it as a 
a, a client service as such, or maybe you do, I might be wrong with that assumption, but where does pay-per-click stop? What, the general pay-per-click people, does that also include things like paid quote ads, paid Facebook ads? So pay-per-click um, means pay-per-click. So there, there's two, uh, well, actually, there's three main, take that back, there's four uh, main um, means of payment. So pay-per-click is you set a bid of what you are, are, are happy to pay um, and you pay every time the user clicks the ad, not every time the user sees the ad. Um, this is in, in sharp contrast with a CPM or cost per milli model, which means that for every thousand impressions, um, you pay uh, for that engagement. Uh, there's also a cost per view. Um, so think uh, YouTube, TikTok, so on and so forth. Um, then there's also cost per lead formats. Um, so uh, Google rolled out uh, a couple of years ago something called local uh, search ads. Not local search ads, local service ads. I always mix those up. Um, and what's nice about local service ads is that you tell Google how much you want uh, to pay per lead, and it will serve uh, it will serve your business, um, and they're they're all local businesses. Uh, to a user searching either online, through their phone, through their voice assistant. Um, and those are all governed um, in terms of how they rank, um, not just by what you say that you're willing to pay per lead, but also how well you're, you're reviewed. Um, and it's a very, very stringent background check to get those approved. Um, the other one that's cost per lead is actually on smart display, um, which can be amazing if you have the budget to get the data that you need. Um, the, the kind of devil's bargain with smart campaigns is that they need a lot of data, so you have to invest aggressively to teach the machine. But once you have that that learning, um, they they really do perform well, sometimes outperforming humans if the, if the human is average. Um, and what's nice about cost per uh, lead on the display side is that you tell Google, I want to pay uh, $5 per person to sign up for my, my webinar so that I can nurture them um, because you figured out that some uh, based off of your conversion rates, based off of how much you make per customer, based off of your, your sales cycle, that someone watching this webinar is worth $5 to you. You can hand that um, desired uh, cost per lead uh, number to, to Google and, and, and they'll do that. But um, when you think about pay-per-click, you got to think about um, LinkedIn, you got to think about Microsoft, you got to think about Facebook, um, Instagram. Um, YouTube has it to a degree with um, the, the shopping components. Um, but yeah, like pay-per-click. Pay and when I say, I, like I used to t um, refer to myself as an, as an SEM or a search engine marketer, um, PPC is far more encompassing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's it's it, a lot of people, as I say, um, categorize you as just the AdWords person, whereas you are, you, you know, a lot of people, even as an SEO, most a lot of SEOs are actually just marketers. They, you know, they they kind of talk about SEO a lot and stuff, but everything that we're doing is more generalized, I think. And you have to generalize it and be a bit broader to be able to make things work. You can't just focus on one element. I had a really impactful conversation with um, Susan Wenegrad actually about this, of, about how a lot of practitioners um, are doing commoditized uh, disciplines um, and that that's the kiss of death for their relevancy and their ability to be have long-term profit. Um, and what I will say, and this, this is my, me, Nava Hopkins, personal perspective. It's not uh, necessarily WordStream's perspective. Um, when it comes to uh, small businesses, the need for, um, say, a, a, a website, the need for um, a, a full-blown marketing plan um, the ad networks are making a play to try to absorb that need and basically saying, small business, give me your money. Um, that's, and, and we'll, we'll make leads happen. And there are, there are businesses out there. Well, that where that will make sense because they don't have the time to worry about it. 
um, where I think there is still a, a play for SMB solutions, whether it's a tool like WordStream, whether it's um, agencies that serve them, is in how we help those SMBs um, make the most of their time um, and and unlock that much more potential in their budget where this, this quote unquote smart solutions from native, um, they're, they're going to provide some value, but there's always going to be kind of some, some waste in there. And so where we can come in and provide value is in understanding all facets of their business, not just actually managing their account, but also what are their sales cycles like? Um, is it, is it potentially useful for us to invest aggressively um, on one part of the business instead of all parts of the business? Um, and so as, as we're kind of thinking about how we position ourselves, how we build our offerings, how we pitch clients, um, it, we have to not just think about what technical skills do we have, but how are we differentiating ourselves from everyone else out there uh, and actually empowering the brands that we serve to, to grow scalably and not burying them in success as in like driving them all of the leads that they then can't service and they feel like it's wasted spend. Yeah. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, one other thing that I did want to talk about um, in terms of you and what you actually work on, obviously you work for WordStream and your speciality is paid search, but what kind of projects does that mean that you work on? Does it mean you just do WordStream stuff or, or you know, how do, how, how does, what, what is it you actually do? Do you work for clients as well? Or yep. I, I, just so that I know. Sure. So uh, my title services innovation strategist was a, was a, a role I created for myself uh, about three years ago within WordStream after I, I kind of ran through the ranks of, of account management. I, I still have a personal book of business, um, but my core job is actually working across the entire book of business, um, our international um, SMBs and agencies that serve them, identifying accounts that need help, um, regardless of whether it's in paid search, paid social, so on and so forth. Um, help, giving them very specific action plan, here's how to, to solve that. But then I also take those lessons back to our product team, to our customer success organization, and share those insights with our, our uh, ad network partners about where are people getting stuck? Like, where can we proactively help people? And so part of my job is doing account work, um, helping clients, client-facing. Part of my work is gaining intel. Um, the other part is actually creating training modules um, and helping grow our internal team uh, so that we can all consult well, um, empower people well, so on and so forth. So um, when, when you ask about projects, um, sometimes I'm working on super high value clients. Sometimes I'm working on agency specific projects. I'm piloting out services. Sometimes I'm working on uh, let's go make Bing or Microsoft um, a happy celebrated citizen. Um, it, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. oh, I was just curious to know um, the background and the inner workings of what you personally do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it was you know, just for the WordStream brand or, or you know, you were doing, as, as you said there, other projects for clients and whatnot. So um, at least you're getting the variety, <laughs> which I think it would be very boring if it was, for example, you know, same rush. say you were doing it for same rush, and you were just doing their stuff day in, day out. I think you would get very bored very quickly um, focusing on one brand. So it's I good to have that diversity. I don't know about that. I feel like depending on the brand, um, the you can be set at, at a, a lot of tasks um, because I do all of those tasks for WordStream. So mm -hmm. it's it just it, it depends on uh, on on the brand. Um, what I what I will say is that the the speaking engagements um, they didn't used to be an official part of my job. Um, over time, I just kept doing them on my free time. Um, and, and it kind of just naturally organically became part of my job here. Um, so it's, uh, like I pick up projects and I, I, I find things that I, I think will help people. Um, and I prove out that they should be part of my job is, is yeah. so that's, that's kind of how I function. <laughs> um, I think sometimes you've got to 
be forceful with it and, and make it part of your job and show the your your kind of peers that you know this this is this is how this is supposed to work. Um, so no, I think you've obviously done that very well, and but it, it's remarkable that you also have went to the lengths of doing it in your own free time. I think that says a lot and ticks a lot of boxes for me with people when you see someone who's got the dedication to to actually spend their own time to not just prove a point or whatever, but obviously just to be better at what they do and whatnot. So I think it's a, certainly a good trait to, to have there as well. And obviously that's why... Um, you're doing so well now. You know you you're getting the rewards from uh, the effort. When when you asked me to be on this podcast, I didn't expect it to be a big ego boost, but I appreciate it. No, it's uh, I, I, what I do is appreciate. I, I mean, I can understand and, and and look at people probably slightly differently from others who may look at you because I've been there, done it, and I can see certain traits within people like doing things in their own time or speaking in their own time to better themselves and not just you know it's not just the ego boost you know I've had to do it as well and and it's paid off for me and and I think that hard work and dedication is what actually makes you either a mediocre marketer or whatever term you want to to say that you are um and obviously all of the kind of guys that that are at the top end of the game um, and, and you know, speaking at all the big events and doing really well for themselves are those ones who just went that extra mile. And I think, obviously, for the podcast listeners listening, um, you know, there are people who are at the start of their journey, and and you know, there's some people who do SEO and just see it as a nine to five job, um, or not just yeah, SEO you, people. You like can't do that. Be. You can't. Um, like this is, if you have a nine to five job, um, and this is my biggest character flaw is I'm incapable of a nine to five job. Um, but you cannot treat your work as a nine to five job. If you're going to be in this industry, like it, you have to be so in love with the work or you're going to get burnt out so fast. Um, <laughs> like it's, it, cause I mean, think about it. Like right now you're hanging out with me um, at the end of your day and you still have more things to do on a Friday. Like that's insane. Um, I'm, I started my day at 6.30 in terms of like getting work done on the train. Like yeah. we, we, we live and breathe it because we love it. Yeah. It's a, yeah, I think you've got to have that passion for it if you want to be um, as successful as, as, you know, people that we have in this podcast. And as I say, not to massage your ego, I think it's more importantly is showing people the reality of, what you actually do to get to where you are. And a lot of people don't see that, all the kind of background stuff. And as I say, it ticks a massive box with me when I hear or see people doing that kind of thing. I'm like, yeah, that's that's a real person that, that you know, someone I've got a lot of respect for. And, you know, oh, for me, you. I nearly killed myself learning SEO. You know, I was up all night, up to four in the morning reading books. And, uh, you know, the wife was like, when are you coming to bed? And, you know, this is crazy, you, you know, I, I was doing it while I was in a day job and all that kind of stuff, and um, thankfully it paid off in the end. But you know, I've I've got probably similar to you some weird, uh, weird, horrible passion for it, and you know, sometimes randomly on a Sunday I'll you know find a new tool or something, and I'll be sitting there like it's Christmas, yeah. you know, testing stuff like- out or whatever. Um, it's weird working weekends are are just like they just naturally happen and it's um, it's just like we can't turn off and so nah. like my my commitment for 2020 and i hope you'll join me in it is that we'll we'll be kinder to ourselves and our minds and we'll give ourselves a little bit of a break i'm i'm always trying that now i think <laughs> uh, i've got I've, it's taken me a long time i've been in this industry for 17 years i've went through the freelancer stage built up an agency um, now, uh, you know, I've got a, a very small agency and I do a lot of speaking affiliate and stuff like that. But the reason that I'm on that journey is to try and free up time and, and relax a bit more and delegate a lot more. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's where you have to be at. You know, it's getting that balance right because it's not sustainable to, you know, as, you, as you've said, you know, you've said 
burnt the word burnout. Um, you can get burnt out very, very quickly um, if you do not look after yourself. And um, I think you've got to obviously learn the game first, but then you know you can scale up and delegate and and you know all of that kind of stuff and use your money wisely and make your money work for you using the the skills and experience you've picked up along the way. And I think that's working smart and and you know using automation and uh, and stuff like that as well where possible um, is is all key parts to becoming, you know, the best you can be in this industry. Completely agree. Um, But sadly, we are out of time. I'm sure we could sit here and rant for 12 hours um, uh, about all different things, but it was great to have you on, um, talking a bit about your background and, you know, how you've got to where you are and and how you see things, you know, with pay-per-click and SEO. I'm sure... I would love to have you back on in the future talking about other things. So definitely. Um, if you're up for that, we'll definitely get you back on because I think you talk a lot of sense and, um, you know, I definitely think the viewers will benefit um, from hearing hearing about more about your, you know, stuff as we go through the next months and years and whatever else. But um, for anyone who maybe just wants to follow you online or, you know, check your stuff out. Where's the best place for people to to get a hold of you? So my my professional uh, is almost always through my Twitter. Um, so at Nava F, um, you can follow uh, my puppy uh, HK forty seven hashtag PPC Puppy uh, on Instagram uh, for paid uh, tips and tricks uh, through the the eyes of of my dog. Um, because who is going to argue with with that adorable face? Um, you can also feel free to uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, you can uh, check out uh, WordStream. Um, and yeah, that's. I'm just excited to, to share and learn with everybody. Cool. Um, well, it's been a pleasure, Nava. I will put your links to all of your stuff on the show notes because I do a transcription and everything. So I'll, when it's published, I will put all of that information on there and hopefully you will um, have people following you. I'm sure if they're wise enough, they will look to your Instagram or wherever your tips and tricks are. So um, as I say, once again, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And thank you for having me, Craig. It's always a pleasure. No worries. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,